Well, with our Bibles open now to the 13th chapter of Mark's Gospel, we continue our journey with Jesus, and today I want to focus upon the prophetic events that will bring this age to an end and introduce that final stage of our God's plan for our redemption, which is the kingdom of God upon this earth for a thousand years. Now, each time we pray, what we pray this morning, it's called the Lord's Prayer. It's really not the Lord's Prayer. It's a model prayer because it gives you the ingredients of a true time of prayer. You have to kind of break that out. You can see that. But when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, we are, in effect, praying and longing for that day when God literally brings heaven down to this earth. And uh, Satan is going to be removed from the earth at that time, at least for a, a, a thousand years. The curse of sin is going to be lifted. Can you imagine what you can grow when the curse of sin is lifted? Jesus will rule the world with truth and grace and make the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. And those he redeemed with his precious blood will reign with him on this earth now for a thousand years, and then in the new heaven and the new earth forever, world without end. And that's where we're going over the next several weeks here from this pulpit, God willing, and we get everything done. Now, until that day, until that day, let me just kind of put this as a parenthesis here, the Holy Spirit can bring God's kingdom authority into our lives if we will do one thing, just die to self. That's it. Die to ourselves, submit unto the Lordship of Christ. For as Jesus said in Luke 17, 21, once we confess Jesus Christ as our Savior and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, the kingdom of God then is within us. So we are, in essence, bringing the kingdom, have brought the kingdom of God into the world. Now, that there is a kingdom to come, but we're part of that kingdom. We're little stones in the kingdom of God. So if we want our corrupted culture to become more of a Christian culture, where does it start? We start with our own heart. We don't start with the folks out yonder. We start with the folks right here. We draw a little circle around ourselves, and we get very concerned about everybody in that circle. That's where we start, by building the kingdom of God. Dying to ourselves, number one, taking up our cross daily, number two, and walking in this world, watch this now, just as Jesus walked through the city of Jerusalem, what was he doing? Carrying his own cross and enduring the shame and the scorn and the ridicule of the very ones he came to save. So we're going to be walking in this world, carrying our own cross, enduring the shame and the ridicule of the very ones we're trying to hear the gospel. And when we allow Jesus to live his life through us, you know what the, what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit's going to enable us to see this world through the eyes of Christ, and we're going to see more, more evil than we've ever seen before because our eyes are open to it. We've been touching nothing but good, and we're going to see nothing but bad. And then he's going to empower us to be his witnesses in this world, even to those, even those who are trying to remove every semblance of God from our culture and to silence every voice from proclaiming the only truth that can set them free, we're going to have a passion for them and a compassion for them that is going to be of Christ and Christ alone. That's the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. So having walked with Jesus now from his baptism in the Jordan River several weeks ago, through the wilderness of temptation of 40 days and 40 nights, through the three years of his earthly ministry, there in Galilee, then in Judea, and then reluctantly into the city of Jerusalem where he was falsely accused, arrested, whipped, beaten, flogged, crucified, buried, where three days later he was resurrected from the dead, seen by the disciples, seen by more than 500 people at one time, finally to the Mount of Olives where he ascended back into the heavens from which he had descended and from whence he shall descend again, where he sits now at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for the likes of us. And then he will, we are waiting now for the what? For that glorious return. That glorious return, we'll get more specific about it next Sunday, God willing, but it will, it, he will, um, the glorious return, first of all, we f will be for us, for the believers, for those who receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Look up here for a moment. From the time of his coming to the time of his departure. Has nothing to do with the Old Testament saints. Has nothing to do with the 
with the tribulation saints, but he's coming for his bride. He's coming for his bride. The Apostle Paul described that event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 18. He says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. He didn't say he'll return. He said he will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And then he says, those who have accepted Christ as their Savior, but they're buried, your moms and dads, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, your children, whatever, if they receive Jesus Christ, then they will be resurrected from the dead. Then we who happen to be alive and remain at that moment, if we are, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That cannot be the return of Christ. That is called the rapture of the church. And it says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So wherever the Lord is, that's where we will be. And he said, then let us comfort one another with these words. Uh, that's what I want you to get today. Comfort, comfort, comfort my people. Knowing that we are where we are. We are exactly where we need to be. God is sovereign over all, in all, and through all. The, the clock is winding down. He set it up many thousands of years ago. It's about to go off. And we're about to be lifted up from this world. The rapture of the church is the next event on God's prophetic calendar. And since it will happen without any warning, it could happen before I finish the next sentence. It is always imminent. Now, while those who are raptured will stand before the judgment seat of Christ in heaven, that's us, to give an account of the days of our lives on this earth, those who are left behind will endure the judgment of God upon this earth for their rejection of God's Son as their Savior. And while there will be those who will be saved during that tribulation, the majority of them will be martyred for their expressed faith, and those who aren't martyred will suffer the global um, pains of agony and suffering like the likes of which the world has never, ever seen before and will never, ever see again because God's got to get rid of those who's uh, rebelled against him and he's got to remove this world of every evidence of sin. So second, not only will he come for us, but then seven years later he will come with us. Jude 14 and 15 says, Behold, the Lord comes with thousands of his saints to execute his judgment upon the ungodly. Again, I'll get more specific in this in the future sermons, but I hope you're paying attention today. Revelation 19, 11 through 21, the Apostle John said, When Jesus comes again, the Antichrist and the false prophet will rather the kings of the earth to wage war against Jesus. But it's going to be just a speck in the dust here. He's going to destroy them with just the word of his mouth. The Bible says every eye shall see him. The Bible says every knee shall bow before him. The Bible says every tongue will confess him as the King of kings and Lord of lords that he already is, uh, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, as then the government of the whole world will be placed upon the shoulders of the Lord Jesus. And throughout the, uh, throughout the whole world, the name of Jesus, you ready for this? We read it this morning. We'll be called what? Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Jesus Christ will rule the world again with truth and grace. Now, on the front of your order of service, if you take your order of service and turn it over, you will find a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and just six verses, 20 through 26. As a <clears throat> preface to our sermon today, I want us to read this together and read it aloud. It begins with the word, Christ is risen from the dead. You right? Ready? Ready, Go. Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who fall asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Now stop right there for a moment. Now just listen as I read the next few lines. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. What's Jesus Christ doing right now? He is buying back the kingdom of God that was surrendered in the Garden of Eden. And on this day when he does this, he will give God the title deed to this world back to God the Father because he's redeemed it with his own blood. So pick up reading with the word then again. Ready? Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. 
The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Did you get the picture? All enemies under his feet. Did you get the picture back of the cross? And the feet of Jesus were up on the head of, of uh, Goliath who represented Satan. And all enemies must then be under his feet. So according to Ephesians 1.10, God's eternal purpose has always been to establish his kingdom upon this earth as it now exists in heaven. And that is the goal to which we are now working. If we want to see changes in this world, we need to be about the advancement of the kingdom of God. For now, we don't like this, but this God sovereign, he's granted a, a, a measure of rule and authority and power to us and to Satan. But ladies and gentlemen, no matter how big we think we are, or how big they think they are, it is all temporary. It can be taken away just like that. Because soon, Jesus is going to return. And he's going to bring an end to all human rule and authority, even to all of Satan's power. And having redeemed this earth from sin and Satan, Jesus is going to deliver the title deed to this earthly kingdom back to God the Father, again, having redeemed this earth with his own precious blood. And then he will sit down at the Father's right hand and submit himself once again unto the Father's rule. Now, that's where we are. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the events that lead up to the day when Jesus delivers the kingdom of this world back to God the Father. And we'll look at these events, hopefully, in their chronological order. We may take several Sundays to look at one thing. We're going to begin with the rapture of the church next Sunday, probably the next two Sundays. And then the judgment seat of Christ. That's not going to be a picnic, folks, because we're going to have to give an account of the deeds done in our body. We'll have to give an account of, the, of our days upon this, uh, on this earth. And then we'll also, while we're doing that, people down here going through the tribulation, so we'll take a general course on the tribulation. We won't get in depth here, but we'll just take the general course there. And then the return of Christ, then the millennial reign with Christ, Satan's release for a little while, his final rebellion, final judgment, the great white throne judgment, and finally the new heaven and the new earth where we will live with heaven, we'll live with him for eternity, world without end. Now today, I want to go back and just uh, look at the origin of what we know as the kingdom of God. How God has shown us that no matter how big or how great or how strong or how powerful any human government or any human kingdom is, it's no match for the kingdom of God. And, he, and God has done this over and over again to show us there is no power greater than the kingdom of God. The word kingdom is used 369 times in the King James Bible, 162 of those times in the New Testament alone. But I want you to take your Bible and turn back to the second chapter of Daniel where the kingdom of God, the first mention of the kingdom of God is in the second chapter of the book of Daniel. Young Daniel, of course, they were in bondage, but young Daniel, the prophet, told the king Nebuchadnezzar that God, a sovereign God, this is the first time this is mentioned in the Bible now, that God had decreed that the extent of man's days upon the earth would be limited to that of four human kingdoms, and the fifth, of course, the kingdom of God. But look at it, the, the, uh, he, he starts out with the Babylonian, the Medio-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman, with the final kingdom being destroyed by the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who would then establish the kingdom of God, of which there would be no end. This is all back there in Daniel chapter 2. We'll read it in just a moment. So the central theme of the Bible is God's divine plan to establish his kingdom on this earth. And it is that kingdom that we are to seek first. Three things we want to see beginning with the prophecy of the kingdom. Pick up reading with me in verse 31, chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. You ready? Say amen. Daniel said, you, O king, were watching, dreaming really, and behold, you saw a great image. And the, I have a picture of that image in the study guide. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone, which was cut without hands, that's the rock of Jesus Christ, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. 
the wind carried them away so there's no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became the great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now just stop for a moment. Where would be the battle, where would all these kingdoms be today? Again, he says they're, they're like the dust. You, there are no Romans, there's no Babylonians, there's none of those people of those first earthly kingdoms. So this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom. You've given you power and strength and glory, and wherever the children of man dwell, on the beasts of the field or the birds of the heaven, he's given them into your hand, and he's made you ruler over them all, and you are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall be ruled over the earth, and then a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people as previous kingdoms were. It shall break into pieces and be consumed, all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain <clears throat> without hands, and then it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Now, understand this. This is not the only biblical prophecy that talks about these kingdoms. Folks, especially young people, this is also secular world history. It's actually verifiable historical Data. You say, what are you talking about? Well, there was such a thing as the Babylonian Empire. It was the first worldwide empire that existed from 612 to 539 B.C. Our soldiers walked through the ruins of the Babylonian Empire when they were over there in the Battle of Iraq, the War of Iraq. The Babylonian Empire was overthrown by the medieval Persian Empire, which had existed from 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. This is modern-day Iran is the modern-day Turkey, which some scholars believe could become the capital of the world during the tribulation, and I think that's probably true. The medieval Persian Empire was overthrown by the Grecian Empire. It, it's, um, the Grecian Empire existed from 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. The Grecian Empire was overthrown by the Roman Empire, uh, which lasted from 168 B.C. all the way around to 476 A.D., probably the last the longest lasting of the, those empires, and the empire that was in power during the time of the earthly ministry of Jesus. And by the way, the empire that crucified people, the only empire that ever crucified people, which means Jesus had to be born in that particular time period in order for Scripture to be fulfilled. Now notice the statue in your study guide, if you will. As Daniel said, the Babylonian empire was represented by the head of gold. The medieval Persian Empire was represented by the chest and arms of silver. The Grecian Empire was represented by the belly and the thighs of brass. The Roman Empire was represented by the two legs of iron, which is where we are today, if you want to mark that on your calendar or you're on your study guide there. And since this prophecy is yet to be fulfilled about the ten toes, we'll not speculate other than to say, this looks like the ten nations of the European common market which will become the revived Roman Empire. I can't say that for sure. I'm not going to say this is that till it occurs, but it sure looks like it. Notice as one empire was defeated by the other, the metals they represented became less and less valuable. But notice the other side. The nature of their empires became stronger and stronger and meaner and meaner. 
And even though these four world empires existed during their respective times over a period of years, they were united in their hatred for and in their desire to destroy the nation and the people of Israel. You've got to put that in your, in your grist mill, if you will. So today we live in that final world empire. It's not an empire, but it's a political arrangement of nations, and we're always fighting over the land, the land grants and the, where our lines are drawn. That's going to be wars and uh, nation against nation and, and kingdom against kingdom is what Jesus said. It's illustrated there by the two feet and the ten toes. In other words, the people of the world are not united under a worldwide authority. However, however, after the rapture of the church, the nations of the world will be forced to establish a new world order under the global authority of the Antichrist, which is the kingdom of Daniel, the kingdom that Daniel said would be destroyed by the second coming of Jesus Christ. Daniel 2.45, he said, he saw a rock not made by hands, in other words, supernatural, come from the sky, destroy the two feet and the ten toes. In other words, the destiny or to destroy the kingdom of the Antichrist, and then that rock will become a huge mountain, and it will fill the whole earth. That is the kingdom of God. Daniel 2.44, he said, God will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall consume all these earthly kingdoms, and this particular kingdom will stand forever and forever and forever. Now, as we look back at history, we see the accuracy of Daniel's prophecies is nothing less than spectacular. It, you can verify it in the old World Book Encyclopedia. You can even verify it in Wikipedia today. It's there. The odds of any one person foreseeing these historical facts is simply phenomenal. But Daniel was a man of God. Daniel was showered with God's wisdom, and he was showered with God's prophecy. Then Daniel chapter 2, verse 28, the prophet said this, There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Jump down to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And so... The theme of the kingdom of God being upon this earth can be traced from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Of the 14 prophets, eight of them, Joel, Amos, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, they all wrote of the day when God would send his son to establish his kingdom on this earth. Now, again, you've got folks in the pulpit today who do not believe this. That's why I'm sort of excited about it and a little bit angry about it today because how can you, how can you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ if you don't preach about the second coming of Christ to establish his kingdom upon this earth? You're not preaching the whole counsel of the word of God. You're not even complete. You're not even preaching the whole gospel. There are 318 references in the 216 chapters in the New Testament that refer to Jesus' second coming. How are you overlooking those verses, preacher? How, who, are you better than God to choose the verses that you think are inspired and the ones are not? That's one out of every ten verses speak about the return of Christ, yet you never hear it from the majority of pulpits. Isaiah 2, 2-4, through four, the prophet said, Now it shall come to pass. In the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of this mountain and shall be exalted above all the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to, to the house of God, the Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his path. Can you imagine the day when people can go to Jerusalem and sit beneath the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and hear him teach just like they did 2,000 years ago? For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from the Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall rise against nation, 
no more, neither shall they learn war anymore. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, we read it this morning. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government is going to be upon his shoulders, and his name is going to be called worldwide. Oh, man, wonderful. He's going to be counselor. He's going to be the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Mm, my goodness gracious, I get excited here. Ezekiel 37, 24, God spoke through the prophet and said, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes, and they will do them. They will not, this will not be a democracy. This will be a theocracy, and Jesus Christ will be king of kings and lord of lords, and what he says will, be, will happen. No vote on it, no uh, maybes, no second motions, nothing. It will not be in the discussion. It's going to be done. Amos 9, 11. Prophet closes out his prophecy with these words. On that day I will raise up a tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. That's us. Says the Lord who does this thing. Behold the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. You know what I mean? I'm waiting. You're planting out there. I'm already reaping. You better hurry up or I'm going to catch up with you. I was telling the guys Wednesday night, I don't know how this all worked out, but in my house we had one of those push mowers. You push it and the blade turns this way. And my brother and I were supposed to cut the grass. And for some reason, I always got the job of pulling that mower. And you know what happens when you pull the mower? If he pushes it faster than you're pulling, it's going to get your heels. That's why I don't have any heels on my feet right now, because it was cut off by the lawnmower. Can you imagine the reaper sending the plower and the sower? You better hurry up out there, because we're going to reap in the harvest you sowed last week. That's what it's going to be like in the days of the kingdom. Revival of David's kingdom and the full restoration of the land of Israel. The, 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 sweetheart, the desert's going to bloom like a rose. And the, it's, it's the basis of everything that we talk about in scriptures. God's going to call out a people for himself, a kingdom of priests, Peter called us, a people of his own in future to inhabit the kingdom of God. And as we've seen the Jews return in droves now since 1948, we can just sense something is about to happen. Majority of Jews are in the world today have now made their journey back home, and they're anticipating the coming of their Messiah, which we know to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. Look at the proclamation of the kingdom of God. If you will turn to Acts chapter 1 now. I know I've got you all over the scriptures today, but that's all right. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons uh, which the Father has put in his own authority. Even the angels didn't know, and at that time even Jesus didn't know. Now put yourself in the disciples' sandals for a moment. These men knew what the prophets said about the coming of the kingdom of God. They'd heard it all their life. <clears throat> these men saw what was happening to the people of Israel. These people, would, they, they had left the temples in Jerusalem and walked out to a place called Bethabara <clears throat> to hear John the Baptist proclaim the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I mean, we're talking about little about thousands and thousands of people who made that journey out there, probably 35, 40 miles, no buses, no taxes, maybe a few donkeys, but primarily on foot, to hear John the Baptist preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And then when Jesus began to inaugurate his earthly ministry, the first words out of his mouth were these, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when the crowds began to declare Jesus to be the great deliverer that God had promised to send to the Jews, the disciples concluded, okay, maybe Jesus is that man. Maybe Jesus has come to set our nation free from Roman oppression. Maybe he is going to establish his kingdom. So even though Jesus told him many times, read the four Gospels, he told him, no, guys, I didn't come to be your political savior. I didn't come to be your human ruler. They thought, okay, maybe he's just shouting it. Maybe he's just shading it a little bit. He doesn't want to tell us everything right now. There will come a time when he will reveal himself and, and we'll be right beside him. But so they came to him privately and said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And again, Jesus said, no, no, no. Uh, this is not in my purview, only the Father in heaven knows. So in Luke 17, 20, 21, the Pharisees demanded, Jesus, tell us, you tell us, 
If you tell us that you've come to establish your kingdom, we will believe in you. Notice what Jesus said, Luke 17, 20, 21. The kingdom does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here, see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Now that doesn't mean there was not going to be a physical, literal kingdom, but listen, he says, listen, you Pharisees, if you don't want to recognize me as the king, it doesn't matter when the kingdom of heaven comes. Did you hear what I said, unbeliever? Did you hear what I said, nominal Christian? If you do not want to recognize Jesus as the king, it doesn't matter when the kingdom of God's going to come because you're not going to be a part of it. Now, we can't be too critical of the Pharisees for none of the disciples believed that Jesus was going to be resurrected. Where were they at the tomb that night? Where were they at the tomb the next morning? They didn't believe even the women who came and told them, I've seen Jesus. Oh, no, we, don't, we can't. That's not true. Let's go and see ourselves. They were startled when Jesus just kind of walked through the locked door in the upper room and said, good morning, gentlemen. However, when Jesus opened their understanding of the Scriptures, they finally realized why he had to be crucified and resurrected and three days later to prove himself as the Messiah, the Savior sent from God. So we really can't blame them for asking Jesus one more time. I mean, right before he ascended, he said, uh, okay, Lord, now, is this, you got about 13 seconds now, Lord. Is this the time? Are you going to do it before you? No. And, of course, Jesus told him, look, it's not within your purview or mind to know the times and seasons which God the Father had already established on his calendar even before the foundations of the world. But once they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to understand it because they would become his witnesses to the world that have their part in the kingdom of God, their part in the kingdom of God. One more time, say it with me. Their part in the kingdom of God. What's our part? To advance the kingdom of God by sharing the gospel. And that's exactly what they did. Christians do not, Christians today don't understand. They're longing for the kingdom of God. Why? Because we're not under anybody else's authority. We're not under Roman authority. We're not under communist authority. We're almost there, but we're not there yet. We don't understand that. Because other than the level of political corruption in which we live today, we kind of like the current kingdom in which we live because we're free to do as we pretty much please. However, when we receive Christ as our Savior, <laughs> the prayer of our heart became, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in my heart as it is now being done in heaven. And we begin to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And we allow the Lord to provide all those things he deems right and necessary for our existence and our subsistence and our witness in this world. Number three, we'll kind of hurry here, the presentation of the king. Turn back to Mark chapter 13, just one verse. Mark 13, 26, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Now we'll be coming with him at this moment, so we'll not deal with us at this moment right now, but we're talking about those who want to see him. So go back to the Gospels. Jesus was leaving the temple in the city of Jerusalem for the last time. He taught his disciples here many times about the kingdom of God. And so when he walked out of that temple that day, in effect, God himself, God the Father, is the one that shut the door not only on that physical temple, but as the place where the Jews could come and worship him, but also he, he shut the door on the whole Jewish system. Now you want to fast forward after 70 AD, they've never had a temple. Since 70 A.D., the Jews have never had a temple. They, they're going to have a temporary temple in, in the tribulation, but then when Jesus comes again, there will be a brand new temple, and it's going to be glorious. Matthew said, Jesus declared, your house is left to you desolate. What was that? What did he mean by that? Mark said, one of the disciples said something about the beauty of the buildings, and Jesus said, look, you see these great buildings? You see this great temple? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, folks, I want to tell you, that was more than the disciples could begin to understand. But this temple was the most precious and the most important place in their lives. Suppose somebody came up today with a bulldozer and said, okay, I'm giving you 10 minutes to get out of here because I'm, I'm going to tear down every board of this building. We'd all get there out there and weep because it's the most important place in our life. But at that time, that temple was not only the most important place in their life and the most beautiful place building in Israel. It was the most beautiful building in the world. Marble stones highlighted with gold-plated moldings at the top. Every, 
uh, every column. Some of those columns were 40 feet long, 18 feet wide, weighing more than a ton. And we want to wonder how they got them to stand up there. It had taken more than 50 years to build that building, and the Jews were very proud of it. But to Jesus, it had become a stumbling block to their knowledge of him. You worship the building instead of the one for whom it was designed to worship. And so it's got to go. It was designed as a place for God's people to worship God, but the Jews had turned it into a marketplace like many churches are doing today. And they made a mockery out of their services of worship. And Jesus said to, those, to the gentlemen there, the disciples, you see these beautiful buildings? One day they're going to be torn down. The destruction will be so massive that not one stone will be left in its place. And beloved, such a destruction did happen in A.D. 70. And the ruins are there for all the world to see, including what they call the Wailing Wall, which is the last, um, it's the outer wall of the temple, the last remaining edifice, if you will, that's remaining of that temple. And the Jews go there every day to pray, not to repent, but they go to pray, God, would you restore the temple? Would you restore Israel? Would you restore our kingdom? Mark 13, 4, Peter, James, and John asked Jesus privately, Okay, you won't tell everybody else, but tell us. When will these things be? And what's going to be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? But rather than answer their questions, Jesus outlined three events that will be taking place on the earth just prior to his return. Not to the rapture now, but to his return. Mark 13, 5 and 8, 5 through 8, Jesus said there will be spiritual deception. This is during the tribulation. Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and he will deceive many. That's the Antichrist. And we're seeing that today is little Antichrist arising up here, various presentations of the false gospel, presentations of a phony gospel, a market-driven philosophy of ministry, man-centric worship services that glorify the leaders and the participants rather than the one who should be worshipped. I thought, Steve, this morning we were talking about some things, and I said, Steve, I, I don't ever do anything that would draw attention away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what's happening in many churches today. There will be international disruption. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. They must happen. They must happen. Why? Because nations are going to rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And obviously we're seeing the precursors to that today. We're seeing the theater of war being lined out for the Battle of Armageddon, WW3, whichever one you want to call it. If we were looking at a globe today and a shining light would pop up indicate where there's conflict, that little world globe would look like a chandelier because there's conflict everywhere in almost every nation. And while our desire is to try to find some way to minimize the threat of these wars and to protect ourselves from it, Jesus said, listen, these kinds of events don't indicate the nearness of the end of the age, but they're simply examples of the curse of sin and man's inhumanity to man. In other words, wars and rumors of wars are always going to be that way. You can't watch a Western without finding the, the image of war. It was, it's always been a part of life. It's always going to be a part of life. Why? Because sin isn't here. It's not out there. Nobody out there causes us to sin. The sin originates in here. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And then there will be physical destruction. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Oh, there have always been earthquakes. There have always been floods and fires and violent storms. And Yes, we're seeing an increase of it today. But the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, I believe it is, that the whole earth groans, groans in agony for the day that it will be free from the curse of sin. That's why Jesus said we shouldn't look at these events as the indicators of the end of the age, but rather just as the beginning of sorrows. They're part of it. However, and here's what he said, and here's what you need to hear today. When all these events are occurring, and we see them all over the world at the same time as we're seeing them today, we need to look at them as views like the pains of a mother giving birth. So the birth pains don't start until we end the tribulation. They will increase in their rapidity and in their intensity until the church is removed from the earth by the rapture, and then human history enters that final seven period, seven years of time called the tribulation, ending with the glorious return of Jesus Christ. And remember what Jesus said, suffering and sorrow like the world has never, ever seen before, now will ever see again. That's the tribulation. And Jesus will come at the end of that tribulation. He will be crowned as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He will establish his kingdom upon this earth, there in Jerusalem. And he will rule and reign 
in those earth for a thousand years, the new heaven and the new earth forever, world without end. Now listen to me carefully as we close. The clock is ticking down. The clock was set. You can name how many thousands of years ago you want, back at the beginning of time, even before the beginning of time. And when, the, when time began, the clock was set. It's counting down. Tick-tock, 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 tick-tock. It's ticking. And soon the whole world is going to enter into the time of great sorrow and suffering, the likes of which the world has never seen before. Wars, famine, disease, death, earthquakes, floods, fires. Even the sun's going to be darkened. The moon's going to give away. The third of the stars are going to fall. And when I believe God's going to certainly keep his word and deliver his elect from such a wrath, I do believe, I do believe that we as Christians are going to see the precursors to all this. And we're seeing it right now. As well as the evil of mankind in response to it. In other words, it's not what's happening to us today that is quite frankly the problem. We could probably adjust to that. But it's what others are doing in adjusting to it or in not adjusting to it. That's what's causing the problem. Because we're now at odds with each other. We're not at odds at what's going on. We're at odds at each other about it. And that's exactly what Satan wants to happen. Listen, God never intended this wicked world to be our home. For no matter how good or safe or pleasant and productive we make it, Jesus said the time will come when this earth and this heaven will pass away and there will be a new earth and a new heaven. And the prayers of God's people for, uh, for many generations are about to be answered because the kingdoms of this world are about to be consumed by the kingdom of God. It could be seven years from today. And when that happens, folks, when Jesus finally comes and rids the world of sin, removes the curse of sin, casts Satan into the bottomless pit, there will be no more sin. There will be no more thorns who infest the ground. There will be a kingdom where God's grace will be flowed far as that curse is found. It will be a thousand years like we've never imagined, like we would like to see it today, but it's not going to be. It's not to happen in our lifetime. And with all due respect to those believers who may be called preppers, it's time for God's people to let go of this world that is passing away and grab the hands of all those that you, with whom you want to live in that new world that will never pass away. For God has not left us here to preserve this way of life. God has left us here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to, to the lost world and to seek his kingdom first. Because this kingdom is going to be ruled by the King of kings and Lord of lords. This kingdom will be where the people of the world will come and hear the truth from the lips of the loving Lord Jesus Christ. It will be a kingdom where the Holy Spirit will rule in the hearts of all men, at least at the beginning, so their lives are filled with joy and peace. It will be a kingdom where the sovereign will of God is gladly carried out by those on the earth as it's now being carried out by the angels in heaven, a kingdom of which there shall be no end. Beloved, our society has devolved into a raging battlefield. It's, all, it's in our homes, our marriages, it's in our schools, it's in the law, it's in the culture. Satan knows his days are numbered and he's doing all he can right now. He's waging his final war against anything that's good and holy, hoping to prevent people from hearing and seeing the truth and the love of God. That's what he wants to do to get us all so hot and bothered that the lost people can't see the love of God through us. Let's not put our hope in some human savior to restore our way of life where no matter how good it was, it was never designed to last forever. Let's cry out unto God for his new kingdom to come and his sovereign will to be done on this earth as it's now being done in heaven. For when Jesus comes again, Satan and all of his minions will be defeated. You can name them if you want to, but they're all of his minions. Jesus will set up his throne there in the city of Jerusalem. He will be the king of kings. He will be the Lord of lords over all the earth for a thousand years. And then in the new heaven and the new earth forever, world without end, and all God's people said, hallelujah. Say it with me. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you for the picture you've given to us that this is not the end. 
We think we're living into the end of the days, but Lord, there's a day coming that's worse than today. But there's a day coming that's better than today. And that's the day we need to keep our minds on the valley. We're living in the valley, the valley of man today. But soon we'll be shouting from the mountaintops and we'll be seeing Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Lord to me, Master, Savior, Prince of Peace, ruler of my heart today. Jesus, Lord to me. Oh, Father, thank you for that precious promise. Now, Father, help us to all admit right now that none of us deserve to be in this place. None of us deserve to be surrounding your throne. None of us deserve to even be filled with the idea, much less the thought or the promise of a glorious future in your kingdom. We were lost. We were sin sick. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But you sought us and you bought us and you redeemed us with your precious blood. Help us never to take that for granted. You've now empowered us by the Holy Spirit. You've opened up our eyes to see this world through the eyes of Christ. You've given us a vision beyond ourselves, beyond our lives, to see this kingdom that needs to be advanced. Oh, Father, help us not to cling to the things that's going to burn. Help us to cling to the things that's going to last forever. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look, if you've never